everybody. Hi, everybody. How are we doing? Good. My name is Kerry Cranston. I'm the president of the American Writers Museum. Some of you know me. Some of you have seen me multiple times today. Um, and I want to welcome you to the final program on the main stage of the American Writers Festival. Um, and I am not going to try and be funny because I am coming in front of Peter Sagal and a host of other people, and I will look pitiful. So I'm just going to say the American Writers Museum takes an expansive democratic view of writing. Our permanent exhibits contain great works of literature, but they also honor our screenwriters, our advertising copywriters, our experimental poets, and the people who have possibly taught the toughest job in American letters. I forgot I had this on. Our comedians. Anyone who's ever tried to tell a joke at dinner and heard deafening silence knows how hard our guests work. To talk about writing American comedy, please welcome the following. Cristela Alonzo, the first Latina to create, produce, and star in her own network sitcom, the first Latina lead in a Disney Pixar film, and the author of the memoir, Music to My Ears, My Years, sorry. Two-time Emmy winner and one of the original writers of the Colbert Report, Peter Gwynn, founder of the comedy troupe Baby Wants Candy, Karen Chi, writer for Late Night with Seth Meyers, The Golden Globes, and The New Yorker, and an Emmy nominee. Alexander Petrie, American humorist and newspaper columnist at the Washington Post. And our moderator, Peter Sagal, the host of Peabody award-winning NPR News Quiz, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Welcome our panelists to the stage, everybody. And thank you. It's out. <laughs> Hi, I'm Peter. Um, and by way of introduction of this panel, uh, occasionally I am critiqued. I feel like we're going to have a rap session. I know. Guys, I, like we're do more I than want to talk extreme. to you about the dangers of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say is this, is that occasionally I am critiqued uh, on the internets as, well, you know, Peter Sagal is not as funny as he thinks he is. And what they don't understand is I have a very realistic idea of how funny I am. <laughs> and what I do in response to that is I surround myself with people who are funnier than I. And four of them are here. Um, they have all at various times uh, made me look good by showing up next to me. Uh, but the main reason I am here and I wanted to do this is because I have been ostensibly writing comedy for 25 years and I have no idea what I'm doing and I hoped that they do. <laughs> so I, l let me start here by asking each of you how you got into it, how you decided if it was a decision that, oh yeah, comedy, that's what I'm going to do. Peter? Oh, hello. I'm Peter Gwynn. Uh, I started, I, uh, in, I guess my drama school teacher in high school did improv exercises with us and it seemed like fun. And then in college I took uh, theater and improv and I realized after college that improv was much easier because you didn't need to memorize things or build things. <laughs> and so I, I went in that direction. Right, and, you, and Peter was uh, uh, one of the stars of I.O. back in the day, yes. and as well as worked many back times in Second City, so he's a Chicago comedy guy. Christella. Uh, I was a big theater nerd growing up. I grew up in a border town in South Texas. I couldn't afford to see Broadway shows, never did but I fell in love with sitcoms. And I always thought that sitcoms, when done well, are pretty much what I call theater for the poor, the accessible, where like anyone with an antenna has access to it. And I really loved doing theater. And my voice teacher, when I was 18 in college, said, as a Latina, you could do West Side Story, Chorus Line, and that's it. And they were right. At that point, I did West Side Story and I did Chorus Line and, you know, Rent w you know, was hot and I didn't book that. And then I realized if I wanted to ever have a chance, I was going to have to write everything myself. And I just wanted to write something that was funny in it because I love sitcoms. I decided to focus on comedy because my family's really funny. 
And, you know, I'm the least funniest person in my family. And I wanted to focus on that and actually show people that someone like me can be just as good as everybody else, if not better. Alexandra? So I actually write for a newspaper, and it's funny that people keep being like, well, you know, this is a way of writing comedy, because I like when you show up somewhere and they introduce you as like, you're a humorist, because it's like, oh, is that a comedian where like, people are like, I'm angry and I want to be made to laugh forcibly. <laughs> like, uh, a humorist is like, I will chuckle once and then we'll have some fondue or something. I don't know. <laughs> but, so I like that like, the, the, getting to write words on a page and have people laugh at them later, as opposed to saying words out loud, which is now making me think, why am I on a panel where I'm gonna to have to say words out loud to people? This is not my comparative advantage. I should be typing something. But also, I wanted to apologize for the mask because I just gave birth uh, voluntarily, like we used to get to. Um, <laughs> back uh, in early 2022. And uh, so, yeah, I'm just doing that for now. Um, also, the bottom half of my face is disgusting. We're comedy, though, writing it. Uh, <laughs> I came from a family who were always like, you're very normal. You're very normal, and we are very normal, which should have made me suspicious. And uh, I knew I wanted to write something. I thought maybe I wanted to write existential like horror. And unfortunately, getting a job at a newspaper, I didn't have to do anything different. I could just <laughs> <laughs> type what was occurring. So that's what I do, basically. Uh, I, I like to write horror, and it turns out that's what comedy is these days. Yes. Oh, I should also point out that Alexandra is also the author of the funniest thing on Twitter, at least it was back in the day, which is the emo Kylo Ren account, which I think is... <laughs> R.I.P. He sells shoes now. He got hacked somehow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, what's your origin story? Um, my origin story is that I, I was and continue to be just a big square. And um, I, didn't wa I wasn't allowed to watch TV for most of my childhood, except for Arthur. So I just thought Arthur, <laughs> Arthur was the greatest show. I still think it's the best show ever. I'm so sad it just ended. Rest in peace. Um, they didn't kill him off, I should clarify. He's like <laughs> alive and well. Um, <laughs> But yeah, and then one day when I was in, I think like eighth grade, my friend showed me The Office on YouTube and we were like, what is this? And then I, um, I also, this is going to embarrass you maybe, no. but when I was in high school, I fell down this rabbit hole of like, oh my gosh, comedy is so cool. And I didn't realize there were comedy writers who wrote all these shows, one of which was like The Colbert Report. And you were on this Paley Center panel. And I think I watched that panel thing on YouTube like 12 times. Like I was like, how do I become one of these people? And you said, one day I'll be on a panel with that guy and <laughs> yeah. we made it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Second question. How do you know what's funny? Peter, go first. <laughs> Um, oh no, I'm the oh I'm sorry. Did wrong Peter. I Peter. have a I have an answer for that actually Please. because it it circles back to the thing that made me so angry at uh, Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. Uh, which, I, I should that's the show that that was one of uh, Aaron Sorkin's few failures. It was a show about a, a show very much like Saturday Night Live and all the backstage drama. Yeah, and there's a moment in the pilot of that show where uh, there's a hole, there's a gap in the show and we need to fill it and what are we gonna do? And uh, the boss is played by Matthew Perry and a writer comes in and is like, I think I've got it. I've got the missing two minutes. And he takes the script and he goes, this is funny. <laughs> and I went, no it wasn't, cause you didn't laugh. And that's the answer. You know it's funny if it makes you laugh. Now I get what they were saying that we're all like jaded people who've seen everything, but still, like, at least your eyes smile. Right. Like, <laughs> something like, you know, something gives you a little twist feeling and you laugh and, and smile at it, and that's just how you know. There are other things where you like, oh, this is the format of a joke, but is not funny. Right. This might get a laugh from an alien that did not speak Earth language just because of its pattern and the 
th and the the noises it makes, but you're gonna you're gonna feel that, and you feel that when you're writing. The best thing in the world is when you you write a joke and then you laugh at your own joke on the computer. You laugh at your own jokes. Yes. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> I, I, to me, because, you know, I ended up getting a TV show based on my life. So for me, stand-up, what I learned was that everything that was funny to you was going to be funny. And that was the problem with a lot of people that when we started, so many of us were trying to write what we thought people would laugh at. And there's a difference in that. Because when you're trying to create something that you think people are going to laugh at, they never will because it's not coming from a really honest place. Anything, everything comes from the truth, for me. You know, and the truth can be hilarious, and science fiction can be based on truth, you know, and everything it is. So, like, how do you know it's funny? I've always said that if I think it's funny, if I would laugh at it, because in stand-up, you know, I'm writing everything, and then I go to a club, and I throw these ideas out, and then it becomes an episode of something, you know? And you just kind of go up there, and you're like, go with me on this. But I always learned that for you to trust what's funny, you really have to trust your voice and know that you got the idea for some reason. So you go with that, even though it generally doesn't maybe start like a good idea or like maybe it sounds like a sad topic, you can make it hilarious because that you, you wanted to. You had that, you, you, you wanted to and you know, that's what you do. I think you're the only one here who has regularly worked as a stand-up. Mm -hmm. Oh, so sad. <laughs> and no, stand-ups to me are terrifying. I could never do that because the idea of just getting up by yourself in front of people who probably are drunk and definitely hate you and want you to fail and making them laugh. And, but one of the things that I know you guys do, stand-ups, is you will come out with material and you'll try it out and you'll see what, mm -hmm. you see what, and see what they respond to. Oh, that's funny. Oh, well, you work on that. You'll sharpen that. Maybe tomorrow I'll do it differently. I'll put an emphasis here and maybe we'll get a better laugh. Um, do you ever like try something with an audience and they don't laugh and you're like, they're wrong? Absolutely. <laughs> because then you realize, because you have to gauge what room it is. You know, there's a, there's a couple different rooms that have different audiences and they're like demos. And you know that one demo might not get, if I'm playing a room like in Hermosa Beach, which is an, which is an affluent neighborhood, if I talk about, you know, growing up a squatter in a diner, which I did, they're like, what is this? Mm -hmm. You know, it might be a little hard for them to understand, but if there's a room where you actually see that it's a makeshift, whatever area it is, if it's in a, a community that actually has that, like maybe kind of like socioeconomic like reasoning in life, they connect with it differently. So you have to think, are they gonna go with that? Do they understand that? Because again, it's like uh, some people won't get it, and you, you just can't, you can't explain it to them. <laughs> being first generation anything is different than being second generation or being here for many generations. And if people don't understand it, it's okay that they don't understand it because people will. And, you know, I'd rather get the people that get it wholeheartedly than try to appease everybody because when you try to, when you get a laughter at 100% or 80%, it hits so much harder and it's so much more special than getting a whole room at 40%. I'm going to skip you for a reason I'll explain. And I'll go to <laughs> uh, uh, Karen, uh, how do you know what's funny? Oh, um, well, first of all, I want to say I also do stand up comedy. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I think I'm pretty good at it sometimes. Um, no. I, um, that's I, I that's why I, you, you looked sad. I'm so sorry. I, no, it's fine. I don't care. It's all dumb. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think I know, kind of like what you guys were saying, I think if it makes me laugh, it's fun. I, um, one of, something my friend said to me once after seeing me do stand-up, Peter, um, <laughs> is... He, he Wait, like, you do stand-up? <laughs> Well, obviously um, not memorably. I yeah. mean, <laughs> I'm sorry. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is bullying. You brought me here to Chicago to bully me to my face. It's just no fun doing it over Zoom, Karen. So. 
one of my friends said this to me after a show, and I was like, I think this is a neg. But um, he was like, no, no, I mean this in a good way, which is he was like, I was like, how did you like the show? And he went, you look like you're having so much fun on stage. And I was like, that's such a horrible thing to say. <laughs> you should just say, well, you should say, like, you were funny. I enjoyed it. Not, you look like you were having a good time. <laughs> um, but I think I, I love laughing at my own jokes. I love laughing. It's like, it's so much more fun that way. And I, I do know some jaded comedy writers who were like, this is funny. I think this is really good. And I'm always like, then why do you have this job? Do something you else. Quit. Go do something else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do, do, you, do you trust the audience all the time? Or do you like Cristela? Like, there's material, like, they just don't get it. I'm going to keep this stuff. I think, it's, I think it's both. I think sometimes I trust the audience on stuff if I'm like, I'm too alone on this. And then other times I'll be like, oh, I know this is funny because it yeah. makes me laugh multi like, even the third time I think about it. Um, in which case, I'm like, oh, this is maybe for a more niche crowd. Yeah. It's enjoyable to tell a joke where you get one laugh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because you're like that guy you see seen you're like oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he knows well, you what know I'm what about. I'm talking about yeah. you get it I, I actually get I got to a point especially in improv where my favorite thing to happen was when I'm like here we go everybody I've got such a killer joke and then nobody laughs because <laughs> it's so funny to me uh, because it's surprising, but then also I'm like, wow, only one person in the whole room thought that joke was funny, and it was me. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. The reason I saved uh, Alexandra for last on this particular question is uh, everybody else here is involved in various kinds of performance or collaboration. You're the only one here who, at least for the ex purposes of this conversation, d writes on a page or a screen and then it goes out to readers and you don't get to sit behind every reader and see what they're laughing at. I, I should play, also, Alexandra also writes plays, so she's into that too. But in terms of like writing your humor, your satire for the post and your books, how do you know what's funny? What's going to land? Well, I'm team definitely laugh at your own jokes because it's the only time I'll get to hear anyone laughing at these jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Since I can't like follow people to their breakfast table and like crouch there to <laughs> see if they get the newspaper out, see if they like read me instead of like Chuck Lane or whoever else is writing on the page. You know, that's really just the logistics involved or out of this world. And I don't think I can do that. So I have to, I feel like, give each joke its valedictory laugh as I send it off into the internet. Um, but I'm also a big fan of what you were saying, like being like nine people's favorite thing rather than a hundred people's ninth favorite thing, to borrow a quote from title of show, the musical. Woo! <laughs> Which, this is very much like my st style of joke, where it's like, I'm going to reference a thing that I really like, and I hope there's one person in the audience who also likes that thing, because otherwise, as in your case, the only person who liked that joke is the person typing it out, which is kind of sad to discover. But, you know, happens occasionally. But I think as everyone's been saying, what you think is funny depends a lot on what you think is true. And so with satire especially, like, there's the Babylon Bee that's out there. They're tweeting. They're making content. And there are people who are like, I think that the realm of reality that is occupied by this, these jokes is the realm that I also occupy. And so they're like, yes, another joke about Hunter Biden's laptop. This is the content I crave. And... Like if, but if you don't feel that way about the world and you're like, this is a waste of everyone's time and like there's actual things going on, uh, then that's not gonna make you laugh. So I feel like people are always like, yeah, but like comedy, like can it change things? Is it powerful? It's like, well, if people don't agree with the premise of your joke, comedy will do nothing for them. They will just be like, you said a sentence. But if they do, or if they, you can sort of occupy a space in between there where you can get them to think that what you were saying like you start out the same place and then you take them to a slightly different place and you sort of leap over a crag together like a goat of some kind. Uh, that's when maybe you can do something with it. But again, it's on the page and so I have no idea if it's working. Uh, can I ask you guys about your process? I mean, Karen, I understand you do stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Not to brag. So tomorrow night, yeah. You're going to go up and you're going to do a stand-up set, and for the sake of this example, it's all new material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you just take your special, yeah, and you can't yeah. reuse that stuff. Right, right. So where do you start? 
Um, I have like a, a notes app on my phone. Um, notes app? Yeah, I have a phone. <laughs> Feel free to get my number. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, anytime I think of something that I think could be funny, I always write it down there. And sometimes it'll be an observation that I think is weird, but I think has the potential to be funny. Can you give an example? Um, you have your notes app handy? I don't. I didn't bring my phone on stage like a good performer. Um, but something that I, a joke I've been working on, oh, maybe this is like dangerous to say, but something I've been working on is that I, you guys know the concept of grooming? Right, it's kind of like a dangerous thing where it's someone older, especially like an older man, starting to sort of groom a younger woman to become like the perfect wife for him. It's kind of a creepy thing. But then I was realizing the other day, I was sort of just like, oh, I have the exact same like musical tastes and cultural tastes and preferences as somebody who is older, who I think has been grooming me for a very long time, uh, and it's my mom. I have, <laughs> she's just raised me to be exactly like her in every way possible, where I like go to a restaurant and I order a cup of hot water, and I was like, that's what my mom does. Um, so I'm like, that was a moment where I was like, oh, this is weird, and those two things feel parallel, so now I can probably try and crank out some jokes from this. But I haven't done it yet, right. <laughs> so we'll see how so it goes. So it's like, oh yeah, my mom groomed me, and then that somehow has to become a joke somehow. Yeah, I mean, I think that would sort of be the punchline. I would have to sort of figure out how to set it up and then get there. I don't there. think it counts as, as the bad kind of grooming if they've also physically groomed you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Combed your hair. Yeah. They've combed your that's hair. Actually, that's a really good point. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's just, that's just rearing at that point. That's just raising somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Sounds like this is a bad joke. <laughs> I should start over. <laughs> Christella, I, I hear about how stand-ups talk about writing jokes. Mm -hmm. And I once talked to Alonzo Bowden, who's also a colleague, and I said, do you actually sit down and write jokes? And he said, no, you know, I'll go out on stage and I'll, I'll try something. And if it works, I'll remember it. I'll work it the next time. Do you, do you sit down and like, have your notebook and like, write your jokes? I started stand-up in 2003, and I have every notebook I have ever written in. I carry a notebook all the time. I write all my jokes with pen or pencil. I think it makes me memorize them completely better. Uh, once they're done, or once I feel like they're at a good level, I type them out in a laptop so that I can have a master, master list of them. But everything I say on stage has been thought out. Every word, everything, I will always say it exactly the same. I just shot my second Netflix special in February, and it's like one of those things where um, I'm the person that if you told me you have to do a 15 minute set, I will get off stage at 14 minutes and 55 seconds. Wow. And it was, and leave them wanting more. And it's all, uh, yes, you know, I mean, you know, we try to get away with it. But yeah, no, I, I've always been a creature of habit, and it's one of those things that, um, you know, that was one of the things that George Carlin was always known for, is for writing everything and memorizing everything. And to me, coming from like a theater background, that's what you do in theater. Right. Right? So it was this thing where if you're going to craft a joke, that's how you do it, right? So like one of the first jokes I ever wrote was about, um, I thought one day, let me write something specific. And I just thought about it. And I thought, what's something specific about me that I do all the time? And I thought, lying on resumes. <laughs> And then I started thinking, what happens when I lie on How often does one do that? I mean, oh my all God, the time. all the time, all the time. And then I started, so I wrote lying on resumes. And then I made a list and I th thought, well, okay, why do I do that? I'm like, well, because I don't have the experience. You know, I want the job, I need the money. You know, and then I started thinking, well, what do I do when I lie on resumes? And I started thinking, my sister's always my fake boss. <laughs> so I wrote down, my sister's my fake boss. Right? So then I started thinking, well, what's a ridiculous job that my sister could do? So I picked, well, what if I applied at NASA? So I wrote NASA, so I'm like an astronaut. So the act out just evolved into my sister who was like, who lived in Mexico for a big chunk of her childhood. So she has an accent. So then I thought, well, if they call her for references, it's just my, my sister like at the house, like, hello, is NASA? Like, you know? <laughs> And, and it, it ended up evolving to where, like, uh, I started thinking, well, if she's a mom at home, what's ridiculous, what, something ridiculous that would happen at NASA? And I wrote down that my nephew, Sergio, was acting up. So she started threatening him. So it, it became this thing where I'm like, oh, it's a countdown. So it's like 10, 9, <laughs> eight, And that's the evolution of the joke. And it just started from that line, lying on resumes. And it evolved into all of that. 
and I wrote everything down. So, you know, when you tape a special or you're going to do any kind of set on TV, you have to turn in a transcript. And that's one thing in all of the years that I've been doing stand-up, I have never gotten a note on anything because everything I write, like stand-up wise, has been down to everything, like just down to detail. And I love working like that. To me, Alonzo, I, I love Alonzo. We call each other our favorite Alonzos. <laughs> and I love, comics can do that and I always think it's so great when they can do that. I can't do that. I just can't and that's what works for me. Uh, Alexandra, I think of you people here, and of course I'm gonna screw this up again, you're the only person here who has like a, what is it, twice or three times a week deadline that you have to fill? Oh yeah, in theory it's every day, but I like that you think that it's twice okay. or three times a week. Um, well, sometimes I forget yeah. to check your page. No, I, sometimes I, I don't get the column in. All right, so, so you, you're, you're the columnist. Have you columnist, read any you're, of you're our the, bios, Peter? <laughs> you're the daily humor columnist for the Washington Post. Uh, so you get up in the morning or whenever you get up or and whenever you do this and you sit down and there's the blinking cursor, uh, where do you start? I too start with a notes app. Um, and like a lot of it is just like, mostly I will start by actually reading the physical print newspaper, which I like better than reading the internet because like there's an end, um, which I, w I would like the internet better if there was an end, um, but it just sort of goes. Uh, so I, I read the physical print newspaper. I start with the comics. Uh, I have a lot of opinions about like Mark Trail. If you want to know my thoughts about Mark Trail, please come find me afterwards and I'll just talk for a long time. Um, and if you don't want that, like avoid me because uh, that won't, that'll be happening. But so after finishing the print comics and then all the advice columns, then I gradually turn to like the actual news of the day, which is usually just fills me with rage and horror. And fortunately I'm fueled by rage. And so <laughs> that's the, like in, X-Men First Class where Magneto, they're like, what powers you? And he's like, the point between rage and serenity. And then he looks deeply into James McAvoy's eyes and they move a satellite together. Like, does anybody else remember X-Men First Class? <laughs> See, in like, this is one of those jokes where like the person who would have loved that joke is not here, unfortunately, today. <laughs> and so I, I, I get the rage and I start typing. And usually what will happen is I'll, I'll tell my editor, I'm like, okay, like by three, which is, because my editor has a nice work-life balance. So he goes off work at five, and then he does like theater. He's like in a production of Xanadu right now, I think. Anyway, he's like roller skating around. He's a cool guy. Um, so I say, Drew, I'm gonna have you a column by a time. And then the time appears, and Drew's like, so where's, where's the column that you said you would have me by this time? And I say, I'm gonna have you the column in like half an hour. And then half an hour passes. He's like, but where is it though? And then I, finally finish writing the column and I hand it to him and he looks at it and I'm like, just kidding. I think now that I've written this whole thing, I have a better idea for how this should have gone. And then I have to rewrite it quickly. And usually that second thing is what becomes the column. Uh, so, or sometimes you just write it and you're like, this was a good idea. And then there was another good idea and it all followed. But usually you have to write like a really crummy version first and then that will tell you what you were trying to say. There's like this E.M. Forster lady who says, how do I know what I think until I see what I say? And that's sort of how I feel writing all the time. I'm like, I don't know what I think about this. Let me just type a bunch and then we'll figure out. So, and then hopefully it contains jokes. Uh, Peter, you're one of many people who became very successful writing comedy who came out of improv. Mm -hmm. So I always assume that you use one to do the other. Right. I, I never trained in improv, so I have a vague understanding of how it works. But is that true? Did like you learn how to write comedy as an improviser? Uh, I think it is true to a certain extent. Um, just the the everyone I think knows the improv uh, thing. Yes, and where I take your idea and I build on it, and I use a modified version of that when I'm writing jokes. Is I'll. I'll Similarly, I have to just like walk around and look at things until the first funny thing occurs to me. Um, and then once that's crafted into a joke, I ask myself, okay, well, if that's true, then what else is true? And in that way, you can sort of like pad out that, that joke to, to be more than a single joke, but a topic that you can talk about for a paragraph or a minute or, or whatever. And you sort of just keep going until it either gets too ridiculous or it leads you to a new area. 
and just sort of follow it that way. So you are like yes ending yourself, basically. Uh, one problem I have, I've learned about myself doing this for a while, is it's very, very hard for me to be funny when I'm angry. Uh, or funny about something that makes me angry. If, I'm, if that has to be done, then I have to sort of find my way through the anger. And I was wondering if you guys struggle with that. Uh, is that something that's a limitation that you guys have, or uh, does it actually fuel you? I mean, Alexander, I've read some of your columns where you were both incandescently angry but at the same time, really funny. And I, is that something that you think you are good at? I don't know. I think the thing that, fortunately, I've always told myself when writing, I'm like, if you don't think it's funny, you don't have to make jokes about it. And I think knowing that as like the bottom line, where it's like, I'm not going to be trying to make jokes if I don't think there's jokes to be made. If I'm just like, this is just a really sad thing that has happened. This is just a, a, an example of how society is broken. And I have nothing to say other than like, this really sucks then I'm not gonna try to say anything else. And I think that frees me up when I'm like, no, but like, there is this thing that's ridiculous that I want people to notice this ridiculous thing because maybe that will also be like, there's an absurdity that I think is funny. Like, but it, it's, it can be difficult. Right now I'm sitting there, so my morning ritual has evolved since the newborn arrived, where I read her the newspaper now, and yeah. just every headline is so bad, I'm like, but I have to do it in like a baby voice, so I'm like, and inflation's continuing to rise. And, and she's like, ah! And I'm like, no, 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 that's bad, that's bad. But there is something funny about being like, and the opioid deaths were higher than ever this year. And she's like, ah! And I'm like, no, 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 it's not funny. And then the trouble is when I'm actually trying to make jokes to her, Nothing. Just dead <laughs> silence. And, and the worst part is, on Wednesday, she laughed for the first time, so I know she can do it. And she's just <laughs> choosing not to, which is enraging to me. I'm like making train noises. I'm like, meow. <laughs> Nothing. Like, it, it, she laughed at it once, never again. So, what did she laugh at? Uh, she laughed that I, I made like a, a little noise, like a world where one shell might make. And I was like, pew, pew, corporal. And she was like, ha, ah, that's funny. Uh, she went, eh. And it was sort of like a filial pity laugh. I feel like she was like, mom is working so hard, I got to give her something. But I don't know. It's like the, it's the baby's way of saying, so how'd you think it went, mom? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, I keep Googling like, how to make a baby laugh, and it's like, make funny sounds. I'm like, what's an objectively funny sound? It's making me like reconsider all of comedy. It's like, what's a funny noise, though? Like, what is it? How do I make it? And I, I can't. <laughs> uh, it's probably farts, right? Yeah. Karen, in reference to your day job, which yes. is writing uh, jokes Funny for crime. Seth Meyers. Yes. Uh, and I love Seth Meyers. I mean, my morning ritual is I watch his... Uh, uh, his main sort of news segment, yes. which uh, a closer look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you got, and by the way, I think they're brilliant. John Oliver gets a lot of credit for doing these very funny extended monologues about serious things, but I think Seth Meyer does it five times a week with your help. You're writing, <laughs> I'm trying to make up for the stand up thing. Oh, Go I'll with me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Although you can make up for it with money. <laughs> <laughs> So your job, you go in, or maybe you do it from home, and your job is, oh my God, we're going to talk tonight about some horrific thing that Seth's going to do his monologue about. It's angering, it's upsetting. He, and I assume you guys, together, find a great balance between being angry and upset and being very, very funny. Is there a technique? Is that something that you're good at? Is that something that you leave to others to figure out for you? How, do, how does that work? Um, I mean, that's such a good question because I think I still haven't really figured it out, honestly. I think it's really hard to write jokes about something that feels like it's attacking you personally. Um, and so even like the recent Roe v. Wade stuff, I was just like, I don't have any jokes about this because it felt like I was having like a very physical reaction, like a very visceral reaction to the news. Um, and I wonder if it is that thing where if you wait a little while, you can find something funny about it and you need time to pass. But um, oftentimes for me, if I can't think of something in the moment, hopefully there'll be another writer in the room who can think of at least as a jumping off point. And then I can think about it in the context of their joke that they've made, how to sort of make that joke better or add on to it. Um, but a lot of the times I can't think of the original first funny thing. Um, and I wanna say like last year, I think when all the Asian hate crimes sort of started happening, 
uh, hate crimes against Asian people, not by them. And um, <laughs> when that was sort of starting to happen, uh, I was talking with the people at Late Night because I was like, you know, normally Seth is really nice about letting people do segments on the show if they want it to be done from their own perspective because he is, you know, like a straight white man of, you know, a certain age and everything. And so if you want to talk about sort of more culturally Asian things, he lets you do them, which I think is really nice. And I was like, I'd like to do something about this, but I just don't have any jokes because it makes me really sad. Um, and he and the other producer were just like, well, then just say what you feel and you don't have to make jokes about it, which I thought was so kind. So I just made Late Night really sad for like six minutes one day. <laughs> I remember that. They were very supportive. <laughs> yeah. You'll, you'll be, yeah, I remember that. It was during that time, yeah. Oh, thank you, yeah. It was, pretty, yeah, yeah. It was quite moving. And similarly, I think some of Alexandra's best columns, and I'm a huge fan, have been for years, have been the ones where she makes no pretense that, that this is funny. Um, Alexandra mentioned this in passing, but I'm going to ask you guys anyway, because I get asked this, and I think about it too much. What good does comedy do? And I say this at a time when things really seem to be going badly. I'll take that. Go. <laughs> Actually, you know, first of all, let me go back to the angry thing. I love to talk about what makes me angry. I think that it's a challenge in a way to present it in a way that you actually trick people into learning. You don't come down, you know, you, you don't come off condescending, you don't come off preachy, you come off honest. You know, and I think there's always a way to do that where you can say anything. and. I have chosen that because that's the kind of person that I am, but also we don't have a lot of Latinas and we don't have a lot of Latinos that uh, in the comedy business that seem to want to do that. To I do don't- what, To do what specifically? Burn bridges, if necessary, by being honest. I think that people forget that in this business, everybody thinks they have to be nice to everybody. And you realize you don't. If people are assholes, they're assholes. And you have to understand the industry, you will always find the people that you connect with, that you're supposed to be with, and that's the truth. Like for me, you know, I think that there's a, there's a joke I used to do about how like, you know, white people, and like I grew up in Texas and I went to school in St. Louis for a year and I was one of the only Latino students in the school, you know, and my best friend was black and he was the only, one of the only black people at, at the school and they took pictures of us like all freshman year and we realized that it was for the brochure. I know what you're talking about. You know, right? For a while I thought and it was it's really like that beautiful, thing. but I was just Asian. Right. <laughs> I'm like, why are we like holding hands with the janitor? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it's that thing where like, so, like talking about that, if you say it in passing in conversation, there's a lot of people that actually get offended just for you mentioning that that's a thing, like a reality. The way that you say it actually makes them understand that, oh, maybe I don't know everything. Maybe this is a different perspective. And one thing that I try to do, and I'll always say this, like, you know, during the 2016 election, I shot my first Netflix special in August of 2016. And after the first taping, Netflix came over because I had Trump jokes. And they were like, well, do you want to drop those because he's not going to win? Yeah. And I was like, no, because it's a moment in time. And that's what a stand-up special is. That's what comedy is. It's a slice of life at that time. And then when he, when the election happened, I don't want to spoil it for you. Like, <laughs> um, after that, two weeks after that election, we, I took my family on their first vacation ever to Hawaii. Like we grew up in poverty. We'd never had a, a vacation. First night we were in Honolulu, uh, these two guys attacked me, my oldest brother, and my special needs nephew, and asked us where we were from. And my brother thought he meant like state, so he's like, Texas. And they're like, no, where are you from? And we had this weird moment, and I thought, I can't do comedy right now. And I wrote a letter to my managers and my agents, and I said, I have to step away from this career because I can't be funny right now. And for the next couple of years during his presidency, I devoted my life to helping my community. And I did all this advocacy work, and I gotta tell you, 
I learned a lot of stuff, and it was very difficult. And then I put it all together, and I did my second hour for Netflix because I want to present it in a way where I thought, this is my truth, this is my history, and whether you agree with it or not, you can't deny that it's not true. So for me, that is one of the biggest gifts I have in comedy. Like for me, that's what I love to do. I love to make awful, tense, weird situations funny because you can find a way and then people, after they leave, after they see everything, a lot of times they're like, oh, we finally get it. I love that. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Yes! <laughs> That's the appropriate response. Uh, I, I want to, we have about 15 minutes left and I want to open it up to questions, but I, there was one other thing that um, I wanted to ask all of you, which is, what makes you laugh? And you're not allowed to say anything by anybody on the stage, even if you were going to. I was mainly going to say Karen's stand-up. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. You're a big fan. Yeah, You're huge a big fan. fan. Big a huge fan. fan. Big she fan. She does stand up. Big really? Fan. You should check it out. It's really good. I had no idea. I love puns and wordplay. Yes. I love dad jokes. I can't do them. I suck at puns. I suck at wordplay. And whenever people can do it, I think they're magicians. Like I just think they're so brilliant. I will laugh at all of them. I think they're the best thing ever. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That's great. I do. I love them. How about you? I like farts. <laughs> really? Yeah, no farts. I mean, like actual farts? Actual farts. As are opposed really to funny. fart humor. Like, yeah, I mean, if somebody were to fart right now. Well, no, so I have a friend who genuinely b believed until she was like in her 30s, she thought that people only farted on purpose. She thought everyone could control their farts. <laughs> and <laughs> she, she went to a yoga class with her husband, and he farted, and she was like, Tim. I can't believe you would choose to fart in the middle of that yoga class when everyone was silent. And he's like, do you not know how farting works? And like she, she went up, she's like, no, no, my mom, we all know that everyone controls their farts. And like her family as a whole is like miraculous people who don't fart like the rest of us do. And so anyway, that's, the, that's I, I love farts. I love intentional farts and unintentional farts. And which is fortunate growing up in my family because there's a lot of it. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I also like highbrow humor. You just like, like hi, yes. highbrow humor. Highbrow humor. <laughs> <laughs> like Aristophanes. Yeah. Aristophanes farting is hilarious. Yeah. Karen? Um, um, I really like awkward situations. I feel like I live my life as though it's like in a mockumentary. And so anytime <laughs> something really awkward happens, I'm like, oh, this is so delightful to me, even though it's probably painful for everyone else in that situation. Um, so like really bad first dates, I'm like, this was such a good time. Really? <laughs> <And then laughs> anytime, anytime a date goes well, quote unquote, where I'm like having a connection with a guy who's being really nice. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Wait a minute. So yeah. when you talked about that, when you said first dates, you're talking about your own. I'm talking about my, I'm not going on other people's first dates. No, no. Dates. I mean, <laughs> no, I, I, I was in the situation just a couple of weeks ago yeah. where I'm sitting in a restaurant by myself and the couple next to me is having a first date. Uh, and I thought that's what you meant, but oh, no. Oh, no, 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 this is for me. <laughs> okay. I'm, um, and so you are having an awkward first date on yeah. your own, on your yeah. own behalf, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you find that hilarious. Yeah, 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 yeah. How do you, how do you express that? Um, I think I just make it more awkward. Once I realize, <laughs> once I realize this person is not going to be my husband, I'm like, well, then let's have fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think you need to say more. What do you then do? Um, I, I, I truly like one time, no, this is kind of mean. There was a guy who was also, I will say, a little bit mean and condescending. So the entire time I was talking to him, I just looked at his ear and he kept being like. <laughs> and then I didn't mention, he was like, is everything okay? And I was just like, yeah. As I kept staring at his ear. Um, which was really awesome, and he still follows me on Instagram and sometimes likes my posts, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. He really wants me, but I said no. <laughs> I am really single. 
<laughs> I can't imagine why. Yeah. I mean. Well, she does stand up. I uh, yeah. <laughs> Peter. Um, I just like being surprised, I think, especially juxtapositions of things and someone being silly and really committing to it. Like, I was trying to ask myself when you asked the question, like, what have I seen that really made me laugh lately? And one of the things that jumped out was David S. Pumpkins on yes. Saturday Night Live, which was just, there were so many levels of, like, owning the ridiculousness of it and really, like, having fun with it and pushing it. And I could share the, fu the hardest I've ever laughed, um, at least at a TV show, uh, was a, an episode of 30 Rock, a joke written by my friend Tammy Sager, very talented. Oh, yeah. Out of Chicago, uh, in the second city. And it is just Tracy Morgan's character finds his old novelty album, and he recorded a song called Werewolf Bar Mitzvah. Yes, yes, Werewolf yes, Bar yes. Mitzvah. <laughs> and they just cut to a slip a bit from the video and it just the snippet of the song is werewolf bar mitzvah spooky scary boys becoming men men becoming wolves <laughs> and my wivo had to pause the TiVo because I laughed for two solid minutes I could I was weeping I was laughing so hard and uh, it, it went from like... This is funny to this is funny to are you okay? <laughs> oh, that's the best. Uh, I know what you mean. Uh, I was actually, I, I, this, this, this breaks my rule because I know Peter helped write this, but Stephen Colbert did a bit that is one of my favorite things he ever did on the old Colbert show where it was about gay marriage. And he was, it was like, because he played his character who was opposed to that. And he's like, let me tell you how to end gay marriage. And he starts a monologue about, this is what you do. You convince a man to fall in love with you. That's how it starts. And five minutes later, he's like at their wedding day. And he's been going on. He says, the day is perfect. And he's describing this amazing wedding. I'm sorry, I'm not doing it justice, but the point is there's something I love about people who commit to a bit and never stop, and they just keep going. It's amazing. I love that. Also, Harley Quinn, the comedy cartoon <laughs> on it is very HBO funny. Max is very, very funny. That's very funny. Um, we have 10 minutes before we have to get out, so if there are questions, please, over there on the right, I see one person. I'm already standing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so... I love y'all's work. This was fabulous. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. Um, I came to comedy late, like Stella. I, I watch sitcoms, but I don't know a lot about comedy. And I have a daughter who is 20 now who wants to do sketch comedy. And, you know, I keep trying to channel the Jacqueline Woodson young self when I told my mother I wanted to be a writer. And she's like, no, you got to get a regular job. But I'm not telling my daughter this. I'm going with the sketch comedy thing. And one thing, I keep telling her that stuff needs to be longer that she writes. But I'm two generations, you know, I'm 30 years older than she is. And am I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm coming from a different time. So this question is for all of you, but mainly for Karen and Cristela. How has comedy changed? How has it changed for people of color? How has it changed in terms of length and, what, and people trying to get into it coming out of the TikTok generation? Uh, I can tell you that uh, in 2014, when I had my sitcom, because I created it, I sat in a marketing meeting where ABC offered me to promote my show by putting talking bus benches in Latino neighborhoods only, where I would speak in Spanish, and as people were waiting for the bus, they'd sit down on the bench, and I would say, hola, Cristel Alonso, tengo un programa, da, 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 and I'd promote it. By the way, the show was in English. <laughs> and when I told them that I would never do that, they got so mad, and they said that I was difficult to work with. And I never got a billboard, and I never got anything, and they didn't support my show. Cut to 2022, in the past eight years, the progress that has been made 
for people of color, especially women of color, has moved mountains. And it gives me hope. I think that I have so many uh, brilliant friends that write with, uh, you know, Black Lady Sketch Show, who I think, you know, they're fantastic. For them to do that on HBO proper for seasons is amazing. I think that uh, just seeing the people that develop and the stories that were allowed, and I say allowed to say, I think that's the correct word, uh, to tell, we're actually getting allowed to tell stories of our lives rather than, you know, I always say this as an example, and, you know, I'm sorry for talking so much, but uh, a typical sitcom episode of a family, like of a white family, had no electricity, and they decided to go bull. And one of them didn't want to go bull, right? They would just talk about like lack of technology and like let's just have family time and blah, blah, blah. Latino show, not at all. Latino show, we would lose our electricity because we couldn't afford it. And then we would try to talk about bowling, but someone's undocumented. And they don't want to go bowling because they're afraid that ICE is going to come get them. And then Abuela, who came to this country, has to tell that guy, like, hey, I didn't come to this country, so you don't bowl. <laughs> and they have this wonderful, touching moment, and the family never gets to bowl. <laughs> but like in the white family, we've, we're three games deep, right? So that right there, what I'm saying is that in 2014, we would have had that episode. In 2022, the family gets to bowl. <laughs> and that's where we're going. So like for me, and also in length, length doesn't matter. The length, the importance of length is when it's funny enough. When you get to the point and you tell the story of what you want to do in the comedy, that's as long as it should be. I've seen improv scenes that last two seconds and it just starts off beautiful and you're like, we can't touch it. It started out magical. There's other scenes that, ran, uh, that run 10 minutes and you know, and it's just enough. When it's enough, then you stop. Karen? Oh, um, yes. You are such a charismatic <laughs> speaker. I forgot I was supposed to also answer. <laughs> um, wow, OK. I have a couple answers to your questions, because I feel like there were a few there. That's so, first of all, that's so kind that you're asking this on behalf of your daughter. That's so sweet. Um, I think there, I actually, I think when it's sort of in writing mode before it is in final form, um, trying to write it longer, I think is actually a really great thing to do. Because oftentimes when I'm writing jokes, I'll go to the first obvious joke. And then if I keep going, it'll get to another spot where I'm like, oh, this is actually funnier and smarter. Um, so I think that's great advice. And then ultimately she can pick whichever one she thinks is the best. Um, and then in terms of sort of generational changes, I think there is definitely a huge, change for especially like comedians of color I think the biggest thing I've noticed when I see older comics and then comics who are younger is that the younger comics don't explain themselves as much um, and I think that's awesome because you're kind of if you're funny enough and you're engaging enough then I think the audience is going to lean in and try and understand you from where you're coming from and then you're also then sort of showing that your target audience is a very specific, maybe a specific demographic, or at least you're not trying to cater to the general white American audience that was the always the mainstream audience for a very long amount of time. Um, and then the one last thing I wanted to say is that I think um, in a very exciting way, I think comedy is kind of quite cyclical. And so I had personally sort of been like network comedy, like network sitcoms are dead. Like I don't care about those. And then Abbott Elementary came around and I was like, this is the best thing I've seen in years. And so, yeah, I, anytime my parents are like, this is cool, and I'm like, that's not cool. Like five years later, I'll be like, actually, that's really cool. <laughs> so I think you should totally give advice to your, to your kid. I think that's really smart. Yeah. Yes, another question, please. Yes, thank you. Um, so each of your careers in comedy is tied to real world events, whether it be like satire or commentary or like scenes from your actual life. And my question is, how do you balance accuracy, like factual accuracy, with the need to respond so quickly, especially in this internet age, with being funny? Like those three factors. So the question was, if I understood it, like how do you combine, how do you, how do, how do the people feel about accuracy where you're talking about current events, but having to be very quick and coming up with something very funny? Um, okay. I feel like, uh, 
I think about this a lot because it's like you have to make certain that you're not making a joke so quickly that you don't know what you're making a joke about. Otherwise, it's like, you know, the, it gets overtaken by events, as the saying is. But lately, I've been, the project I've been working on during my parental leave, and before that as well, is this book of like, basically, I go through history and I'm like, you know, some people are really sad that history uh, happened the way that it happened. And I'm also sad about that. And some people are like, I'm sad that like history books don't say that the founders were golden beings of pure light. Why aren't we teaching, you know, that they were handing down only truths from Mount Olympus in the perfect way. People are criticizing the past. That seems wrong. And then other people are like, why is the only president whose sex diaries we have Warren G. Harding? Um, <laughs> and so I'm like, I got to write a book that fixes that. And so I'm like working on a book. And it's all like me making up things from the past. But I'm also like, but it has to be kind of accurate. Otherwise, it's not going to be a history book. And so I'm just like, well, you know, where do I have to be relative to the actual truth of what occurred in order to be like recognizably that thing, but also a joke? So it's like, for instance, Nikola Tesla fell in love with a pigeon. This is a true fact. Like, he genuinely, like, he, she came to him in his dreams, and he was like, this beautiful bird has bewitched me. And so I'm like, well, that did happen. But what didn't happen is that his friends all got together and like wrote a PowerPoint to him and was like, Nicola, this is a problem. We got to intervene with you about it. <laughs> so I think you try to find the thing that's like, well, I'm adding this, and I don't think it's disturbing the substrate on which I'm trying to build my geological joke construction. Um, and that's how I try to approach it. But yeah, I, I, fortunately, I, like when I'm writing my daily column, I, there are editors who go through and are like, do you have a link for that number you just cited? And I have to find a link. And if I can't find a link, then we take out the number. And so that's good practice as well. Anybody else on that point? I think just that there's a difference, especially on like Wait, Wait, or Colbert, with what you're talking about in the world. Like you have to have a link to the real world somehow. We call it in improv, it's grounding. Like if it's not, if there's not a recognizable path to the world that your audience recognizes, it won't get a laugh because they'll be like, what is this? Um, but if you're talking about the top story of the day that's been in all the headlines, uh, everyone already knows the facts, so you don't need to worry about being accurate with them. You can be a little fast and loose. And it, but if it's a really obscure story of you know someone who tried to rob a bank with an alligator, uh, then it is really important because you're educating them on the story. And so we have, you have a different format than when it's like, I'm going to give you, I have the actual facts of the story. I will give them to you carefully in order with jokes interspersed so you don't get bored. And then we're going to be on the same page. So it's just sometimes you, you have to get them on the same page as you and sometimes you know they're on the same page before you start. Uh, I think we have time for one more question if you have it there. No? Yes? Go ahead. Hi there. Um, I was just curious about how you uh, view or reconcile your, um, an evolution in your own taste of humor. So like where you go and say, hmm, maybe a decade ago I would have laughed at this movie or this thing, and now that makes me go, yikes. Um, and maybe that could be stuff that you've uh, laughed at or, or things that you've done or written or performed. So again, uh, I guess short version of this question, do you ever think that you might cancel yourself? <laughs> wow. That question. I actually don't. I think that in a time, I think that when we talk about cancel culture, we, uh, I, I don't think that exists. I think holding people accountable is different. And I think that um, as long as you, as long as, I've always said, I don't know everything. And there's things that as you get older, you evolve and ch things change and you realize that things were wrong and, you know, you shouldn't have done that. I can't apologize for the past, you know, I can apologize for the past and assure that it will never be done again. But at the same time, we all have to learn, you know? So it's, uh, you know, for me, it's this thing, um, I tell this really messed up story in my standup and I told a friend of mine, it took me decades to realize that it was really messed up. And I told my friend, and my friend's like, oh, why are you so mad? Because that was like 20 years ago. And I was like, because I just realized it was stupid right now. Like, I just realized it was messed up now, like by today's standards. So for me, I always say that as long as you're honest in what you believe in at that moment, 
And for me, like the canceling and everything, I personally don't write or perform anything that I don't truly believe in. But also, I will never write anything that might hurt or cause harm or anything to any other community because I am not that person. So for me, I can, uh, I can be critical of social class. I can be critical of like punching up. You can't punch down. That's just my belief. But I always say that if we can get to the point where we are allowed to make mistakes and allow ourselves to be corrected and allow ourselves to actually correct ourselves, that's how we move forward. I think that especially in stand-up right now, there's a lot of uh, my peers that want to die on this hill, and that just shows that they do not have the brain power to try to evolve into something. They want to stay in the past, and that doesn't work. I, that's, <clears throat> that's such a great answer. I um, want to tack on to that by saying I actually think there's a big flip side to this, which people, I, I wish people appreciated it more, where when we see something that came out in the 80s, right, and it, they were, it was like canon for its time, and when we watch it now and it feels so outdated or you know racist or sexist in some way, I think that's such a nice thing because that just means society has progressed to become kinder and more inclusive, and I think that's such a great, I love that. It's such a tangible way to be like, actually now we would not make Friends, even though Friends was maybe really good in the 90s and like maybe like, considered progressive you know for a 90s show um, but I think it's so awesome to look at that and be like that was a product of its time and time has gotten better and kinder to most of us and so in that sense I kind of do hope um, like maybe 20 years from now if we look back on you know segments I've done if people are like actually that feels really outdated uh, even if that is maybe painful for me in the moment I think that would actually be a really lovely thing that would just mean we've become more inclusive or maybe there's like new terminology that is kinder and um yeah, I'm kind of rooting for that to happen. I think that would be quite nice. Yeah. I, um, I love that. I think we have to wrap it up. I want to thank Peter Gwynn, Cristela Alonzo, Alexandra Petri, Karen Chi. They're all on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow them. Cristela and Alexandra and myself have books that I think for sale. Can you guys hang out a little bit if people want to sign a book? Thank you all for coming, and thanks all for, also for attending the first ever, first of many, I hope, American Writers Museum Writers Festival. It's awesome. Thank you all for being here.